Which super movie had a creative vision to make their main character look like they were made of junk? And just how many actors suffocated for their craft? Here are a few true heroes that really suffered in their super suits. Who hasn't imagined themselves getting to wear Batman's iconic suit and fighting crime? For Michael Keaton, who portrayed the character in Batman and Batman Returns, the experience of wearing Batman's cape and cowl turned out to be more of a nightmare than a dream come true. During an installment of Epic's Hollywood Sessions, Keaton revealed that the very first time he put on his Batman costume, he was so restrained and cramped that he was instantly convinced that he couldn't play this role. After this uncomfortable introduction to his superhero outfit, things didn't necessarily improve for Keaton in terms of his comfort. However, he noted that he utilized his constant discomfort as a way to inform the tormented internal world of Bruce Wayne. Unfortunately, the restrictive nature of this Batman costume was quite visible in the final cut of both of Keaton's Batman movies. Most notably, there are various instances in which Keaton is unable to move his neck in the outfit, forcing him to reorient his whole body when he has to shift his gaze. The Batman costume will always be the stuff of legend, but Keaton's experience with this outfit made it clear that it isn't all fun and games. You'll struggle to find a more iconic superhero movie costume than the one Michelle Pfeiffer wore for Batman Returns as Selina Kyle. This version of Kyle, who's been abused by men her whole life, embraces an outfit that reclaims her identity, while tormenting the men who place so many restrictions on her in the first place. This thematically rich and visually distinctive costume is one of the best parts of the movie, but Pfeiffer didn't always have the best time wearing it. Talking to E! News in 2012, Pfeiffer recalled how the Catwoman suit was so restrictive that she could only be in it for short periods. Still, Pfeiffer expressed interest in playing the role of Catwoman again in the future. However, she'd likely want a much more flexible costume to wear. No matter the medium, the thing has it rough. The incarnation of the big orange brute in 2005's Fantastic Four, played by Michael Chiklis, employed an elaborate latex rubber outfit. It wasn't just clobbering time on the set for Chiklis, it was also time for some extreme psychological turmoil. The outfit proved to be more than a bit cumbersome for the actor. Speaking to WebMD about his health while filming, Chiklis revealed that when he first put this costume on, he immediately felt trapped and was gripped with anxiety. Chiklis' problems with wearing the costume for the thing proved to be so bad that he had to talk to a psychologist to learn tactics that could make his time on set manageable. While this outfit became a bit more bearable as the shoot for Fantastic Four went on, Chiklis was always gripped with fear whenever he had to get dressed as the thing. However, there was good news for this actor once the sequel rolled around. This time, Chiklis was given a costume that was significantly easier to take on and off. The original trilogy of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles movies realized the titular superheroes through elaborate puppet suits, courtesy of the Jim Henson Creature Workshop. These advanced costumes made it seem like these characters had walked off the pages of the comics and into the real world. But they were also incredibly cumbersome to wear for the actors. Josh Pice, the man who portrayed Raphael in the original Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, recalled to The Hollywood Reporter that he felt trapped in the costume, which covered every inch of his body. On the Look Back Machine podcast, directors Michael Press and Stuart Gillard recalled the difficult circumstances the actors had to work with when portraying the Turtles in subsequent films. This included impaired vision as well as having to coordinate with offset technicians who were controlling the motorized parts of the costumes. I love pizzas. Um, I love life. Despite this, the filmmakers expressed admiration for all the performers for committing so deeply to their characters, even though they were encased in such impractical costumes. When the Merry Mutants of the X-Men came to the big screen for the first time in the 2000 movie X-Men, they were saddled with costumes that were a visible departure from what comic book fans expected. Traditionally, most of the members of the X-Men wear some combination of yellow and blue jumpsuits, but those outfits were nowhere to be seen in the film. Instead, the big-screen X-Men were given tight, black leather outfits common to many late 1990s action films like The Matrix. The change in costumes was even referenced in the movie. You actually go outside in these things? What would you prefer? Yellow spandex? In a behind-the-scenes featurette for X-Men, James Marsden recalled how the first day the actors went out in their leather suits, they were required to hop over a seawall to get to the Statue of Liberty. Despite the seawall being only a few feet above the ground, nobody could step over it in their restrictive leather outfits. Marsden even went as far as to say, you couldn't feel less like a superhero wearing those things. Though these costumes have garnered criticism for deviating from traditional X-Men comic garb, they were also a massive problem for the actors wearing them. It's a little tight. Oh, it's fine! 
Ryan Reynolds has made his disdain for Green Lantern no secret, and among the many aspects of the movie that he's criticized is the fully CGI suit Green Lantern wears. The extremely obvious CGI nature of this attire garnered heavy criticism when Green Lantern was first released, and ended up inspiring a particularly memorable moment in the later Reynolds superhero movie, Deadpool 2. However, even before Green Lantern premiered in theaters, Reynolds was offering public criticisms of his superhero costume. Speaking at a San Diego Comic-Con International panel for Green Lantern, Reynolds commented on what it was like wearing a motion capture suit every day that would later be replaced with a digital superhero outfit. Reynolds noted that this attire was incredibly uncomfortable, and his thoughts on the set would often drift towards yearning for a practical costume he could wear instead. At the time, he still expressed hope for all the possibilities of what this outfit would look like once CGI was applied. Not even a Green Lantern ring could make those wishes come true. There are lots of things to regret about a movie as bad as Steel, but one particularly subpar element of the movie was the superhero outfit Shaquille O'Neal was forced to wear to portray the character of Steel. A sharp contrast to what he wore in the comics, the film's vision of Steel gave the hero a rundown outfit without a cape in sight. It looked laughable, not inspiring, and just appeared to be hastily cobbled together. Speaking to Vice, film director Kenneth Johnson explained that this bizarre costume's repellent appearance was all down to how little time the crew had to get the film ready. He also noted that his own creative instincts informed the costume's subpar look, since he had wanted Steele to wear something that looked like it could be made by an ordinary person, admitting that the attire came out looking, quote, low rent. Andrew Garfield had a lot of problems to overcome when he got to play Peter Parker in The Amazing Spider-Man. There were the weighty expectations of following in the footsteps of Tobey Maguire's version of the character, plus the considerations in trying to realize a version of Spider-Man that adhered to the darker tone director Mark Webb was striving for. Then there were also the impractical parts of his costume, which was a surprisingly uncomfortable piece of crime-fighting attire. Speaking on The Ellen DeGeneres Show in April 2012, Garfield waxed poetic about how his outfit was incredibly constricting and made all parts of his body extremely visible. While he noted that the costume is supposed to give a sense of freedom to Parker, Garfield only felt more self-conscious. It's no wonder that his Spider-Man costume got radically overhauled for The Amazing Spider-Man 2. When putting together the solo Elektra film, Jennifer Garner was conscious of how fans had received her first appearance as the character in the 2003 feature Daredevil. During a visit to the Elektra set from Superhero Hype, Garner said that the biggest complaint she'd heard from fans was that she didn't wear the character's trademark costume. While recognizing the fondness fans have for this outfit, she also noted that there was no way to translate it directly to the screen without it looking ridiculous. For Elektra, Garner wore a costume that was a bit more evocative of its comic book roots, albeit with plenty of changes to ground it in reality. Like so many women characters in mainstream comics, Elektra's comic book costume isn't exactly proper crime-fighting attire, so Garner and others involved in Elektra wanted to change that. Unfortunately, the final costume used in Elektra suffered from just not looking quite right. In the end, the costume for the movie version of Elektra was also an impractical oddity. It's not easy to play a woman who's completely covered in scaly blue skin. Though getting to play an iconic mutant like Mystique would sound like a dream come true, there were serious downsides to Jennifer Lawrence's stint in the X-Men universe. Playing Mystique required a makeup routine that lasted seven hours, a process that also left Lawrence with rashes and skin issues long after filming ended. But it got worse. I can't do any form of bathroom. Like, the guy who made it were like, well, she's a girl. She didn't go to the bathroom. So I just be standing up out of a funnel. <laughs> This made filming as Mystique frequently a nightmare for Lawrence, though this would get addressed in her future appearances as the character. Starting with X-Men Days of Future Past, Lawrence would wear a much more stripped-down and mobile Mystique costume, which greatly reduced the amount of time she'd spend in the makeup chair and ensured that she wouldn't have to deal with the nasty side effects, including allowing her to use the bathroom. In his career as a stuntman and martial artist, Ray Park has taken on tons of challenging roles in major motion pictures, ranging from playing Darth Maul in The Phantom Menace to portraying Toad in the very first X-Men movie. Even with all these roles, nothing could prepare Park for his time playing Snake Eyes in G.I. Joe The Rise of Cobra. To play the silent but deadly ninja superhero, Park wore a skin-tight outfit and a helmet, all in the name of emulating the character's traditional attire in other G.I. Joe media. Fidelity to the source material ensured that Park had an enormously difficult time even walking around in his on-screen outfit. Speaking to the website The 213, Park noted that from the beginning, he could tell the Snake Eyes costume was going to be difficult to perform in. He decided to face this challenge head-on by bringing home a costume to rehearse in. Even with this preparation, Park was still taken aback by how he couldn't move once that Snake Eyes costume was put on. 
In 2018, Oscar Isaac sat down with GQ to look back on his various film roles, but when it came to portraying the titular villain of X-Men Apocalypse, Isaac's memories weren't so fond. Apocalypse, that was excruciating. I didn't know <laughs> when I said yes that that was what was going to be happening. Isaac noted that he joined the project because he loved the X-Men mythology and the cast that was already assembled for the production. Little did the leading man of Moon Knight know that to portray Apocalypse, he would be stuck inside layers upon layers of makeup and a bulky suit. In this elaborate getup, Isaac noted that he had trouble moving and seeing the co-stars that he'd been so excited to work with. His mobility was so restricted that a special saddle was made for Isaac that would allow him to sit while trapped within the costume. Ultimately, the reality of portraying Apocalypse did not come anywhere close to living up to Isaac's ambitions for the role. 